गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग ओके वेलकम टू क्लास एवरी वन गुड मॉर्निंग गुड टू सी ऑल ऑफ यू टूडे वो सम काइंड ऑफ एनर्जी इन लाइफ इन क्लास गुड टू सी दैट how are all of you doing give me some feedback about uh, romans because i hardly get any questions from you all and so i'm just wondering uh because you're a very engaging class and now you've currently become very quiet uh so it's raising a lot of questions in my mind you know whether uh, i'm going fast or able to understand are you all enjoying the class uh, finding it interesting can you get some feedback please no feedback yeah me um this is charles um what i say is this book is a technical book it is partly scholarly but also spiritual so um me i am on the part of listening and taking in things so i enjoy the class thank you charles thank you kung anything that we would you like me to incorporate while uh, explaining romans any feedback please feel free to share your feedback it just helps me and help you as well any feedback you'll have okay so uh i'll wait for your feedback if there's any okay we'll continue we were looking at um, uh romans chapter 6 we came up to verse 4 um Okay, Rupa says very intense, trying to process and assimilate. Uh, Sasha is saying that the moment we accept Christ, we are one with Christ. We identify with His uh, death, with His uh, burial, with His resurrection, with His ascension, and with Him seated um, in the heavenly places. Okay. so that is our identification so basically what he's talking about in chapter 5 and what he's talking about in chapter 6 he's talking about the truth of our identification so who we were in adam what we inherited we all know what we inherited in adam and in christ what is the you know our identification where we stand uh, and it's important for us to know the truth of our identification so that we can um, we know what we have received um and it's important for us to know what we have received because then we can stand from a place in, of authority and we can um you know we can influence god's kingdom here on earth okay thank you kung um so we'll move on so here we were looking at uh, that you know we identify with the christ um and all the things that i said and he says that you know just like we were raised uh, christ was raised up from the dead so also we uh raised up uh, in christ and when we raised up in christ what happens we walk in newness of life okay um so we see that you know crucifixion we ended last week by saying that crucifixion is the end when we are crucified with christ it means the end of the old man and it's the breaking of the power of sin and we said when we are buried with christ what it means the end of the old life and uh, uh, the old life has no more claims upon us and when we are resurrected with christ it means that we have a brand new life Okay, we are living the eternal life here and now, and uh, he goes on to talk. He doesn't mention here about uh, Christ's ascension and him seated at the right hand of the Father, but we also looked at it um, from First Corinthians, and we said that uh, you know, in Christ's ascension, how do we identify? We are no longer under the influence of the system of evil and rebellion. 
And with Christ seated at the right hand of Father, we are also seated with Jesus. You know, uh, what, is, uh, what is our place of identification? We operate from a place of authority and dominion on this earth. Okay, and so here he says that, you know, we, uh, when Christ raised us up from the dead, uh, you know, so we walk in newness of life. And I said the life, the word life here is the Greek word uh, that is zoe, it's eternal life. And uh, so when does eternal life start? When does eternal life start? Uh, new birth. New birth. Okay, thank you. Yes, Siddharth? when we believe in jesus okay thank you okay uh, sometimes we have this whole uh, idea that eternal life is when we get to heaven right when we get to heaven we experience eternal life uh, but eternal life is uh, you know uh, uh, something that is uh, a realized eschatology the words theologians use here for eternal life it's realized ex eschatology eschatology means a hope that will happen somewhere in the future okay eschatology is in the in the in the in the future it is going to happen somewhere in the future eschatology okay future and we have this hope that we will have eternal life sometime in the future but it's a realized eschatology means that we experience this eternal life here and now in the present even as we experience the fullness of it in the future okay so it's a realized eschatology that means eternal life does not just start in heaven it starts when we are when we reach heaven but it starts when we are born again um, because uh, you know when we are in christ we ex we are living and walking in the eternal life right now we experience the life of god the fullness of life the god kind of life right now in us and uh, yes we know that some part of it is uh, you know we're going to experience way in the future when our bodies uh, that our mortal bodies are going to be raised imperishable immortal uh, you know uh, but in our spirit man, right now, we enjoy the eternal life. It's already there. But we know it will get better in the future where we will receive glorified bodies and we will be with God in heaven. So the eternal life is already started inside us now. We, walk, we can walk in the newness of life because we are resurrected uh, in Christ Jesus. Yes, we become saints. Thank you, Charles. And we cross over from being sinners to saints. Okay. Then we look at uh, verses um, 9 and 10. Okay, uh, can somebody read verses 9 and 10, please? Romans 6, 9 and 10. Mama, can I read? Yes, thank you. Romans chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Thank you, Elisha. You sounded like Elisha the prophet. <laughs> Such a deep, nice voice you have. Thank you. Uh, so here, you know, in 9 and 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul is saying that, you know, what Christ uh, died for, you know, he died for once for all. So there's no more, uh, you know, uh, there's no more need for anyone to pay the penalty for sin, to die for sin. Christ finished the work. It was a finished work, a completed work. And we see that that no longer has dominion over him and it will always remain under him. So what is he trying to tell us? He's saying that once Christ died for sin, he died for it once for all, and the life that he lives, he lives to God. And so he's telling us what? He's telling us the same way, just like you have, uh, you know, are dead in Christ, you are dead to sin, you know, you cannot, con you, their sin is, you know, death, it's complete. 
It's, it has no more power, it has no more authority over your life, you know. Uh, it's completed, it's gone, it's that past, you know. It has no more dominion, no more power, no more claim, no more hold over your life. It cannot operate in your life because it is dead, same like Christ, you know. He died for sin once for all. It's a completed work. So, so also you need to consider, we need to consider sin as in our body as, as a done thing, is dead, it's completed, it has no dominion uh, over us. And he's also telling us an important truth that now, you know, we enjoy the eternal life, the life of God, the Zoe life of God. And he says, you know, we receive this life. And he says that the life that Christ lives now, he lives unto. God. Similarly, he's telling us the life that you have received as a result of, uh, you, uh, you know, you identify with Christ's crucifixion and his burial and his resurrection, you also need to live your life for God. So wonderfully, he just, uh, and so beautifully, he just uh, uh, puts it, okay? So uh, that is what we need to be conscious about, you know, that we are dead to sin, there's no dominion, no power and hold, no hold over us. The life we're living now, we live as unto God. That means we are, our lives are totally consecrated to God, submitted to God in total obedience, in utter obedience uh, to Christ and to uh, God, okay? And then he goes on to talk about the five action points and how to live free from sin, verses uh, 11 to verse 14. So can somebody please read verses 11 to verses 14, please? Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in it, it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dom dominion over you, for you are not under, con under law, but under grace. Thank you, Asha. So here in verse 10, you know, uh, just looking back at verse 10, he's pointing us to Jesus. And he says, look at Jesus. He died to sin once for all, and the life he lives, now he's alive, and uh, he lives to God. And then he begins verse 11 and says, likewise, which is a connection between verse 10 and verse, uh, uh, verse 11. He's saying, in the same manner. Okay, similarly, just like Christ did, so also, okay, likewise in the same manner, and he's telling us what we need to do. He's saying Jesus died once for all, and he's alive to God now. He's fully consecrated, dedicated to the Father, and hence we too need to live the same way. Okay, we need to also live our lives fully consecrated, committed, submitted in total and utter obedience and holiness and righteousness uh, towards the Father. And then he presents five action points that we must take to live free from sin. Or he says uh, the truth of identification that we have learned of being in Adam, now being in Christ, the truth of Adam, identification of us being in Christ is to be lived out like this. And how should it be lived out? He gives us five action points. In verse 11, he says, reckon yourselves. In verse 12, he says, do not let sin reign. In verse 13, he says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. And again, he says, present yourselves to God in verse 13. And also says in the same words, present your members as instruments of righteousness. So the first thing let's look at is reckon yourself. He says in verse 11, likewise you also, just like Christ is, uh, you know, dead to sin once for all, it's completed and is alive to God now. Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to uh, sin. Reckon yourself means consider your self. Now the Greek word here is uh, it's a, it's a word used for accounting. It's an accounting word. Uh, let me just give you an example. Uh, say a man has 10 notes and uh, uh, each of these 10 notes is a denomination of uh, 10 rupees. Okay, so 10 notes, the denomination, denomination of 10 worth 10 rupees. Okay, however the person counts it, it will amount to 100. 
5k rupees 100 however he counts it so it cannot be disputed it cannot be in any way questioned because all of these 10 notes uh, you know uh, valuing uh, 10 rupees when you put it together when you account for it uh, it will amount to rupees 100 it cannot be disputed uh, and it no it cannot in any way be question and so in the same way it says when you reckon yourself means count it as a fact okay count it as a fact or consider yourself count it as a fact consider yourself that you're dead to sin and alive to god like christ who died once for all but who's to sin but is alive and the life he lives he lives to god okay and he's saying, you know, what he means here is, you know, once for all, embrace this truth, accept it, reckon it, consider it, take it as a fact that you're dead to sin and alive to uh, God, which means that, you know, that we have nothing to do with sin. I have nothing to do with uh, sin. So the first thing we need to do is reckon uh, to sin, that I'm done with sin, I'm dead to sin, and I'm alive with uh, God. And I think as believers, we need to come to this, this place uh, where we understand this identification of ours in Christ, that we are done with sin, dead to sin, that we reckon ourselves dead to uh, sin, okay? And uh, the problem is that many believers, you know, do not consider them Selves dead to sin. They they ask, how can we be dead to sin? Or, you know, I don't think so. But this is a truth which we need to embrace and we need to live and and walk in it and uh, see that uh, you know accomplished in our lives. The second thing is, do not let sin reign. Okay, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Verse twelve, that you should obey it in its uh, lust. Uh, uh, so here it says, you know, not let sin reign in your bodies. Why? Because we are dead to sin and alive to uh, God. Therefore, you know, we can't let sin reign in our mortal bodies. We refuse to give sin any place in our body. Why? Because we are dead to sin, we are alive to God. Sin has no place in our lives. And hence, as believers, you know, we become intolerant to sin. The third thing he says is do not present your members as instruments of righteousness now the word instrument here in greek is weapon so it says you know uh paul is saying don't let your bodies be a weapon of sin or an unrighteousness and uh, even as we you know acknowledge this fact we reckon this through this fact you know uh, we count it as a fact but we need to make a choice okay the choice is that we are not going to uh, submit our bodies as a weapon for sin and for unrighteousness. And then he says, present yourselves to God as instruments of, uh, not as instruments of unrighteousness, but as instruments of righteousness. So he says, it's uh, since it's the act of each one's will, that each one by choice is going to make a choice that we are not going to give up our bodies as instruments of um, or as weapons for sin and unrighteousness but we are going to say god here is my body i present myself 100 percent uh, to you you know and my body is going to be uh, not a weapon for sin and unrighteousness but it's going to be a weapon of righteousness um, which means that god you know here's my body i'm totally consecrating myself i'm totally giving up myself uh, to advance uh, the kingdom of God, to advance in righteousness and in holiness. And the fifth thing he says, present your members as instruments of righteousness. That means we are willingly submitting, consciously submitting, day in and day out, you know, uh, submitting ourselves to the obedience the Lordship of Christ Jesus, uh, submitting ourselves in every area to obeying God, doing His will, yielding every member of our body uh, to God so that every member of our body serves as instruments or weapons of righteousness. Okay, And verse 14, he says, For sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under law but under grace okay that means and he's saying that sin has no dominion over you means that you know sin has no right no dominion over the believers 
And then he says, we are not under the law, but under grace. So now he's drawing a contrast between uh, uh, law and he's drawing a contrast between law and grace. Now he says the law, um, the law told us what are the right things to do. Okay, it only tells us what are the right things to do, but the law does not empower us, uh, does not help us to do how to do the right things. And that's why people failed uh, uh, to keep the law, because the law only told them what was right and wrong. The law told them that, you know, they are sinners. The law told them that, uh, you know, uh, that they have missed the mark, they have uh, gone away from God, uh, and hence they are, uh, you know, under the wrath of God, so they have to make sacrifices, atone for their sins, but the law never empowered them. But the, uh, on the other hand, he's saying grace, okay, grace uh, tells us what is the right thing to do, but also uh, the grace of God empowers us to do the right things. And that's why, you know, we read in the Old Testament, God says, you know, uh, I will remove their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. I will write my laws upon their heart and mind. I will put my spirit in them. My spirit will help them to keep all of my um, way. So God knew that people were not in their own strength. The law was not sufficient enough to empower them to keep his laws, to obey him, to keep his ways. And so he says, I will put my spirit and my spirit will enable you to keep my uh, ways. Okay. So uh, we also know that the standard under uh, uh, the law and, you know, is uh, or the standard under the grace is much higher than what was in the law. The standard under the grace is much higher than what is in the law. Of course, grace empowers us, equips us, um, you know, helps us to stand righteous before God, gives us a right standing before God, uh, even though all our righteousness is as filthy rags. But grace uh, has a higher standing. Okay, so, you know, there's out of the question when people ask, you know, can we continue to sin because the grace of God abounds and, uh, you know, uh, Paul says certainly no. And he's, he's explaining and he's saying here that the standards under God's grace is much higher than the standards under God's law. So what do we mean by this? You know, uh, the law says that, you know, you shall not murder. But what does grace say? You know, the New Testament, Jesus says, even if you hate your somebody, you've already murdered them. Okay? You don't have to do the physical act of murder, but just hating your brother, or hating someone, you've already murdered them. It's equal to murder. Okay, So grace has a higher standard compared to the law. Another example, Jesus says, you know, uh, the law says, do not commit adultery. But what's that grace say? But Jesus says, I tell you that if you even look lustfully at a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You don't have to do the act of adultery, but just looking lustfully is, you know, you've already uh, committed uh, adultery in your heart and you still stand condemned. You still stand as a sinner before God. So, you know, yes, we can boast about the grace that we have, you know, grace does this and that and, you know, has saved us and gives us a right standing and because of grace we are made righteous, we are justified, all that is good, but, you know, there's another side to grace. This is the other side of the coin. Grace is also having a higher standard of living. So, you know, uh, Paul is reminding us of that. He says, you know, don't think because of grace, you know, your life is easy. It's a higher standard. It's a higher calling, you know, and um, we need to, if you're, um, you know, he, uh, we're living under grace, we also, uh, if we've experienced the grace of God, we've come into Christ, we've experienced this truth of identification as a result of being in Christ, you know, we also need to live with the highest standing of uh, that grace requires us to live. And now he uh, he goes on to explain or expand more about law and grace in chapter 7. Okay, We'll move on, uh, verses 15 to 18. Before we move on, does anyone has any questions? So Elisha says, can we say that for grace to work perfectly in the life of a believer, these five things must be done? 
uh, well, not just these five things, but uh, you know everything else that is yes is mentioned in scripture. It's basically living a life totally consecrated, committed to God. Uh, you know, um, in uh, in every area of our life, living in total obedience to God. Of course, these five things are the action points that uh, we do. Uh, yes, reckon ourselves dead to sin. Uh, you know, don't let sin reign in our mortal bodies. We need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Present our bodies as instruments of righteousness. Yes, these five things, and also you know, uh, what else Scripture teaches. Us to. It's not only these five things, but all it's inclusive of everything in these five points, but also the other things that uh, Scripture tells us. Good question, Elisha. Did I answer your question? Yes, no. Yes, no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else has any questions? No questions? Okay, Charles says, is it true we are under grace, but aren't there people use the grace wrongly? Yes, it's true, very true that uh, people use grace wrongly. And I mentioned about this in the last class, you know, when we were, uh, when we're looking at the first rhetorical question that um, Paul is asking in chapter 6. We said in chapter 6, he's basically having, uh, you know, uh, uh, two questions. And, uh, you know, to answer those two main questions, he has two follow-up questions. Uh, and the first main question is, shall we continue that's in sin that grace may abound? So he's already thinking about what, you know, the possibility of this, this question in the mind of his readers or people asking. Now we have the grace of God, so it's okay for us to continue in sin. And what does uh, he say? He says, um, no way, we can't do that, you know, not at all. Um, he says... Um, we can't continue in sin. Why? Because he says, because the obvious reason is we are already dead to sin. Okay? And he says, certainly not. Uh, he says, because we are dead to sin. And yes, people use the grace wrongly, and that is why it's important for us to teach them. You know, and that's why Paul says, knowing this, it's important for us to know that, uh, you know, uh, this truth. And that's why I mentioned this truth, even though it's not in your notes about the law and grace. Uh, about the highest standard of uh, uh, the, of grace compared to the to the law, which is not in your notes, but I'm mentioning it because people, uh, you know, take grace for granted. They say the grace of God is there. You know, He does not call us as sinners. Why are you pointing out to my sin? You know, uh, God is a forgiving, compassionate, gracious, merciful God. So we can do what we want to do. And uh, there are some churches that have come up called the Greater Grace. We have greater grace. We can do whatever we want, and we have greater grace of God. Uh, you know, uh, and the grace of God is sufficient to forgive us, so we can live how and what we want. And that's not biblical teaching. That is not the truth of God's word. And Paul knows that you know people will think like that, and that's why he's writing, and that's why he's uh, he's mentioning it to us that when Christ died for sin once for all, and He lives for God. You know, when we identify with him, we also I, I have to identify with him in this area. And then he brings so beautifully about the law and grace. So it's important for each one of us to teach people in our church, uh, you know, take them through the series of Romans, because they will know the truths, the doctrines of sin, salvation, righteousness, justification, the grace of God. And they will see it in the light of what scripture tells us and will live according to it. Yes. What is the second rhetorical question? We're coming to that in a bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, so can somebody, any, any questions? We're looking at it in verse 15, Charles. The second rhetorical question is in verse 15, which you, we're just going to look at it now. Okay. So can somebody please read uh, verses 15 to verse 18, please, quickly? Uh, from verse 15 to verse what, Pastor? Verse 18, Charles, please. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> what then are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone 
as obedient slaves you are you are slaves of the one whom you obey either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness but thanks be to god that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of the teaching to which you were committed. Amen. Thank you, uh, Charles. So here we see verse 15, he's asking second. Uh, Charles, can you please mute your mic? Thank you, Charles. So here we see in the, he asked the second main uh, question in verse 15, shall we sin because we're not on the law but on the grace? And then he has two other you know, questions to uh, you know, answer, help answer that. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves as slaves to obey, you are that one slaves who you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Verse 16 and verse 21, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? So in verse 15, you know, Paul is continuing his style of asking question, which is a rhetorical question, which he answers or, uh, you know, which he himself answers or the answer is implicit, it's right there. So the question he asks is, what then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? And the answer is certainly not. Why? Uh, because, you know, we've already told you, uh, he's already told us that we need to present ourselves to God. So when you're presenting yourselves, you're submitting yourselves, you're becoming a slave. Uh, and then he's, he's very beautifully talking about under the law, we were the slave to sin, but under grace, we are slaves of righteousness. Under the law, we were a slave to sin, but uh, because the law made it very evident that we couldn't keep the law and we had no power to overcome sin. And so we ended up as slaves of sin. But under grace, he says, we are slaves of God and slaves of righteousness. Uh, why are we slaves? Because we are willingly presenting ourselves to God. We are willingly accepting his lordship and we're coming under his authority we are making a choice to be slaves under him because we're willingly presenting ourselves to um, God and then verse 16 he says don't uh, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey you are you know um, that one slave who you obey whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness so the greek word for slave here is doulos meaning born servant and it's the same word that paul uh, uses to refer himself in romans chapter 1 verse 1 and i explained about it where he says he was a born servant of christ which means he is a born servant of christ means he will voluntarily or willingly chose to be a slave completely surrendered to his master for life to do what his master wants him to do, okay? And so here we see in this verses, you know, we, we need to understand this whole slave or bond servant with that idea that we're slaves of God or slaves of righteousness means we have willingly, you know, voluntarily chosen ourselves to be completely surrendered uh, to uh, God, completely surrendered our life uh, and uh, want him to be the master and want him to do whatever he wants in our life. So Paul here beautifully, you know, contrasts um, law and grace. He says, under law, we were slaves to sin, uncleanliness and lawlessness. But under grace, we are a slave uh, of God and righteousness. Um, in both these cases, you know, uh, we are a slave, but the difference is the master. Okay. Uh, under law, we were slaves to sin, but, uh, you know, under grace, we are slaves of God. Okay. In verse 13, he says that, uh, he's already said that, you know, present yourselves to God. Since having presented ourselves to God, we now become slaves of God and slaves of righteousness we are born servants of god and righteousness we have no option but to live like righteous lives because we have already made that choice willingly voluntarily we have chosen to present ourselves to god and while he says this you know he's giving thanks to god in verse 17 he says but god be thanked 
that though you were a slave of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Okay, and uh, here uh, he in verse 18 he talks about having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So he's bringing a contrast again, he's brought a contrast between Adam, uh, first Adam, second Adam, um, the first Adam, last Adam, first man, second man, uh, the man who is natural, the man who is spiritual, the man who is from earth, the man who is from heaven. Then he brings a distinction between uh, law and grace, and now he brings a contrast between slaves of sin and slaves of righteousness. And he says that, you know, when we were in Adam, we were slaves of sin, but now we've been set free from sin, and now we become slaves of righteousness. Okay, um, how are we no longer slaves of sin and how are we slaves of righteousness? What made that difference? He says it's because we have obeyed from the heart the form of teaching that was delivered to you. So how do we transition from being slaves of sin to being slaves of righteousness? He says because you have taken that step to obey from your heart the form of doctrine or the teaching that was imparted uh, to you. Now this is, you know, the teaching that we are going through is the teaching that, the same teaching that took these people out of being slaves of sin to being set free and to becoming slaves of uh, righteousness. And he says, because you obeyed from your heart, that means you wholeheartedly obeyed, you wholeheartedly, you gave yourself to these doctrines, to these teachings, and that's why you moved on from being slaves of sin to being slaves of righteousness. Now the word form of doctrine, or form of teaching, the Greek word for form is very interesting, it's a mold or a cast. So in factories, when they want to manufacture something, they have molds or casts, and they pour the liquid, whether it's copper, plastic, gold, silver, when it falls into the mold, it transforms itself from just being a liquid to becoming into a beautiful shape of what the person uh, desires. So also he's saying that the teaching or the doctrine that has been brought to you is like a mold. So the teaching and the doctrine is a mold. And when you have an obedient heart, it is like that liquid that has been poured into this mold, which is the teaching or the doctrine. And when it solidifies, it comes out as something different. So it's explaining how we move from being slaves of sin to being slaves of righteousness and he says because you obey from the heart the form of doctrine and he says this form the Greek word beautifully says mold or cast so the teaching or the doctrine is a mold or cast and then we have an obedient heart it's like that liquid that has been poured out into this mold and you know when it solidifies it takes the it has a total transformation that's how we are totally transformed from being slaves of sin to being slaves of righteousness okay and he says that they are slaves of sin but they have been set free from sin why because they wholeheartedly accepted the teaching and that is why it's so important for us to teach all of this to you know people in our bible study or in our groups life groups or in our churches because you know when people when this truth is communicated to them you know just imagine what will happen they will receive the truth if they receive the truth wholeheartedly what will happen the word of god will produce the same results that it produced in paul's time it produced in our lives it will also produce uh, in the lives of the people that we are preaching to and teaching Okay, and then Paul sums up by what he's saying, uh, what he's been saying all this time, and but he recognizes also, as even as he sums up the whole thing, he also recognizes a problem that believers can still have, uh, which he deals with in verses 19 to 23. So can somebody please read verses 19 to 23, please? Quickly. Romans 6, 19 to 23. So I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, 
you are free in regard to righteousness. Okay, yes, continue reading verses 21 to 23. Sorry, it's hurting my notes over here. Um, okay, no worries. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Can somebody else read verses 21 to 23, please? Verse 21, what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit of holiness and the end everlasting life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so he starts verse 19, he mentions, I speak in human terms. That means Paul is saying, I'm using a language that can easily be understood uh, uh, by the people, uh, you know, that he's writing to. And he's referring here to the using of the word slave, because it was a very famous uh, and uh, uh, a term that everyone was well aware of, because in Rome they had slaves, a lot of slaves, they had a slave market. So he's saying I'm using a language that people can understand. And, uh, you know, the, he's using, uh, he's referring to the word slave. He's, and he's saying that as we apply the truth of identification to overcome sin which he has discovered uh, which he has explained at length and discussed in length in chapters 5 and 6 he says now we are going to walk in holiness so what pro what paul is getting to um, is you know he's saying how we can live in holiness walk in holiness but he's also saying there is one problem and that is the weakness of our flesh Okay, now the word flesh has different meanings in the New Testament. The word flesh can mean the outer body, the outer man. Uh, it can also mean uh, sinful, evil desires of the outer man. Um, the flesh here means uh, the natural evil desires of the uh, body. We also see that uh, Paul writes about this in Galatians chapter 5, where he talks about the works of the flesh and he lists out. Uh, in chapter 5, the evil desires of the body. But here he says, you know, the weakness of the flesh. And uh, he's going to elaborate more on this in chapter 7. But how do we get rid about the weakness of the flesh where the sin has a strong grip over us for a long time? He says it's by presenting the members of our body as instruments or weapons of um, righteousness and he says all this will happen you know um, by the uh, how can we present our members he says all this happens by the act of our will and he repeats the idea of willingly presenting or willingly yielding ourselves as slaves <coughs> Sorry, in verse 16, he says, you know, he talks about how we need to present ourselves as slaves to obedience. And now in verse 19, he's presenting or he's saying that we need to present our members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So he says we can, you know, there's a weakness of the flesh that we have in our body uh, where sin has a strong grip over us but he says you know we can overcome it by the act of our will and so he's continually presenting to us the, you know um, the idea of willfully making a choice we have to make a willful choice to present ourselves or yield ourselves as uh, slaves to God as slaves to um, righteousness and that's what we see in verse 16 and verse uh, 19. So he says, you know, before we were born again, we continually presented our members as slaves of uncleanliness to uncleanliness, impurity, lawlessness. Lawlessness means wickedness, violation of the law, not keeping the law, transgression, missing the mark, okay, crossing the line, transgression. And that was leading to more lawlessness. But he's saying now, since we are in Christ and we know our identification, the truth of our identification, he says, now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Okay, so even as we apply this truth of identification, uh, of overcoming sin that he has explained in chapter 5 and 6, we are going to walk in holiness. And, um, and he says that is where we are getting to, but there is a problem, the weakness of the flesh. 
and then Paul reminds them uh, that you know um, that when we were in sin, we uh, the end of what was the end of sin? What is the consequence of sin? What is the wages of sin? Death. Okay, verse twenty one. He says the wages of sin is always death. Verse twenty three. However, if we yield ourselves, you know, uh, give ourselves as instruments or weapons of righteousness unto God, when we yield ourselves as slaves to God and slaves of righteousness, he says in verse 19 and 22 that we will have the fruit of holiness. How beautifully he just puts it, okay? So we have the fruit of holiness. This fruit of holiness will lead to eternal life, okay? Yes, God's grace has made us uh, free from sin uh, and in response to God's grace, uh, we willingly make ourselves slaves to God and slaves of righteousness. And what is the result of this? The result is holy living before God, fruits of holiness which leads to eternal life. Okay, And in chapter 7, which we will be looking at uh, Next Wednesday, the whole he discusses in length about the weakness of the flesh, where he basically talks there about a struggle of a man who has the law of God and he wants to obey it, but he does not have the power to do it because of the weakness of the flesh. And then he explains why the flesh is weakened. And then he goes on in chapter 8 where he says, a born again, what is the answer for this? Okay, the answer for this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we are uh, weak in our flesh. You know, we want to obey um, God, uh, but we don't have the power to do it because of the weakness of the flesh. Um, and uh, he says, what is the answer? He gives us, he presents the answer uh, in chapter 8. He says, for all those who are born again, who are believers in Christ, the answer is the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we know there's a weakness in the flesh, uh, but there is a law. And then he brings about a new law. He says, a law of the spirit of life. So beautifully, he just brings it. He says in verse chapter 8, he says, the law of the spirit of life. There's a spirit of life. There's the Holy Spirit which helps us to conquer our flesh, to crucify our flesh. And so, you know, we'll, we'll, when we study chapter 8, we'll see how um, a believer can live a victorious life, okay? But here he, um, he ends by very beautifully saying that, you know, um, the wages of sin is death, but if we heal ourselves, our bodies as slaves to God and as righteousness, we have the fruit of holiness and eternal life. Somebody had their hand up? Say, say you had your hand up. Yeah, Pastor, I, I, I just rethought, but maybe I should just, I, I thought maybe I'll be going too forward. I was just going to ask, uh, in what context did Paul write the latter part? You know, he answers the question, who oh, wretched sinner, who would save a man like me? Which was like the latter part of chapter 7. In what context was he writing it? I've heard many people say it in a sense whereby, oh, Paul was writing it as a result of what he was feeling. But I think, based on what we're reading, I think he's just putting up, um, how will I put it now? He's just um, trying to put up a question to bring an answer and to give us understanding. But some people feel like Paul was struggling and then he had realized that oh it's the holy spirit that helps and that's why we see in chapter eight he talks about more about the holy spirit so i just want to get clarity in what context was he writing chapter seven especially the latter part where he says that oh um i will uh, there are things i would like to do but yet i can't do them you know and all that and all that what context was he writing was it as a result of his own experience or based off of just trying to bring our understanding to the fact that the flesh is weak and it's only the Holy Spirit that can help us live a life pleasing unto God and in holiness. 
Yes, very good thought. Uh, say um, thank you for the question. Um, I think here he's just, uh, Paul, you know, the questions he's asking is he's already contemplating or, you know, thinking what questions can arise in the mind of people or people who have already asked him these questions or they would have these doubts. So he is, um, you know, uh, you know, he's, he's presenting the questions and then he is, you know, discussing uh, uh, about in length about that and trying to explain and this is uh, you know he says that you know we are dead to sin you know um, uh, um, you know and sin has no power but you know why do we can still continue sinning because of the weakness of the flesh and then he goes on to give the answer so I think that it's um, it's not just because uh, he is struggling uh, we know that uh, all of this, what he's writing, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is, is leading him to write, uh, and it's you know it's so much applicable for us in our day and time as well as it was applicable for uh, the church he was writing to, and also something that uh, you know he had a revelation and understanding about it himself, and I'm sure he was living it himself, and hence he was writing it from his own experience because even though he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It was him using his own mind, his reason, his logical understanding uh, 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 to write, to reason, to explain so beautifully, to explain so logically. So if you look at the whole thing, it's such a logical, beautiful uh, reasoning and understanding how he just brings in everything, how he contrasts, you know, first Adam, last Adam, how he contrasts sin, grace, um, the law and the uh, 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 grace, we're slaves of sin, slaves of righteousness, and he's bring it all so that you know we can have a better understanding of the doctrines and remember he's teaching us uh, doctrines he's bringing out the truths he's teaching us the truths about these doctrines and so it is um, uh, you know it is something that he has clarity on so he's giving us more clarity and more understanding that will help us because this is something that you know people in Paul's time were facing and also we are facing uh, today I hope I answered your question or the query. Uh, say, yes, did it help? That, yes, that, that, that was a good answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What is the meaning of the word members as used? Uh, the members of our body, Paul is basically talking about various parts of our bodies. You know, uh, he talks about it in Corinthians also, just like, you know, uh, the members of our parts of members of our body where he talks about the eye, the hand, the eye can't say, you know, I can I can exist by myself, I can do things by myself. He's con talking about in the context of the members of the body of Church of Christ, of God, where we all need each other. You know, all of us need each other. All of us are gifted in various other uh, in, in various things. We are called to different offices and all of us need uh, each other, just like different parts of our body, which he calls as members. You know, so members of different parts of our uh, body. So every member of our body, every part of our body should be totally in submission. Every area of our uh, of our life should be totally submitted to God. Yes, Sri Kumar. Thank you, Pastor. I just want I need a clarification on uh, what um, what now, Brother C asked. So, is it means that uh, Paul was um, lived a sinless life in that means or? Um, he was no. He was just uh, you know. If that is uh, something, he was. Uh, it, he came to a conclusion that this is something because, you know, he himself is saying that I found these things working in me that the uh, you know the the law of the sin and death and um, you know um, so uh, he was actually waging a war. Uh, no, it means is it not that he's really experiencing that thing with insight and second thing. If okay, say, let's, uh, let's answer the first thing so that okay. I can get to the second question. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a very implicit answer. You know, we, we, I'm sure Paul never thought he was a sinless person. Nobody is sinless. We're all born in sin. Okay, uh, that's what he writes. He says, from Adam's race, we've all inherited sin. That's why we have an inclination to sin. We have a fallen nature. And he also writes somewhere, you know, not that I've been made perfect, but I... Uh, take on what Christ has taken ho hold of. He, is, he says that uh, uh, I think I think in First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, he says I'm not 
you know, uh, uh, not be made perfect. But I continue to press on. I take ho uh, hold of what Christ Jesus has taken hold of me, knowing that I am not perfect. And so I am sure that he is not looking at him as a s sinless person. Uh, he can't be sinless. None of us are sinless. And so he's writing from that point. I hope I answered the first question and then we can go to your second question. So uh, I just want to add one more thing, like whether in the book of John, it says that no one can say that they are sinless. Like no, if uh, somebody says that he's not having sin in him, he's a liar. So that's all I just want to add. That's all. Thank you, Pastor. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Uh, good question. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, did I answer your first part of your question, Sri Kumar? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And just, I just wanted to know because uh, yes. no, yes. that if, uh, no, whether it is when we are coming to a conclusion that whether Paul is sinless or not. So that's no, 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 no. <laughs> that, <is not, laughs> that is not what he's uh, saying. He's uh, uh, yeah, he's just writing so that we can understand and explaining yes. doctrines to us, teachings yes. to us. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sri Kumar. Uh, Elisha, I hope I answered your question about the members of uh, the body. What does members yes, mean? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you did. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elisha. Yes, say. Um, just just a clarification. I, I might be wrong the way I'm maybe interpreting it, but when we say Paul was not was not sinless, I, I hope we're saying it in the context that he was once a sinner, but now turned to God to Christ. Because what we understand about uh, salvation is that Jesus takes away all our sins and makes us justified and righteous. So uh, I, 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 I just want to believe that we are, we are answering the question that when we say we are not sinless, we're not trying to say, oh, we've never sinned before, but that from the standpoint of where we are in Christ Jesus, there's no more sin in our lives. Because yes. it would be better off to understand it that way. Because if we feel that even though we've given our lives to Christ Jesus, we still have sin in us, then of what good is Christ's death and um, resurrection in our life? So I just wanted to point that out, uh, basically. Yeah. Yes, and we cannot say that we will never sin. Uh, because, uh, you know, the uh, the Bible says in Hebrews that he knows, he understands our weakness. And so he's our, you know, our great interceding high priest who's interceding on behalf of us to the Father. Okay, so Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding on behalf of us because he knows our weaknesses. He understands our frailties. Um, so it's not that we're not going to sin or we're never going to sin. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, the whole fact that you know, we can't say that, hey, man, I get angry because this is how, you know, I am. I've always been angry. I can't control my anger. But uh, we can't say that, you know, we, uh, we, we have to recognize that, you know, that um, when we get angry, when we sin in anger, has no justification now because we are dead uh, to sin. And so, you know, anger or how we retaliate when we get angry, um, should not have any more power or hold over us. We need to overcome that. So the this truth is going to help us not to indulge in in sinful uh, uh, activities or in sin, uh, and just give an excuse that you know this is how I am, and you know sin has control over me, and I can't give this up, and uh, you know I can't. Uh, you know, I can't stop telling lies or uh, I can't use stop using bad words or I can't stop looking lustfully at, um, at the opposite sex or, you know, I can't stop, uh, uh, you know, eating beyond, uh, you know, what, what I should be eating or sleeping uh, so much more. We can't just give excuses because, you know, hey, we are dead to sin. That's our truth. And we need to walk in the light of that. And then, you know, we need to overpower sin uh, because we have the weakness of the flesh. Yes, good. Thank you, Sei. Um, good questions, good thoughts. Thank you for sharing. Uh, anyone else? Thank you. We've already moved nine minutes more. Thank you for being patient. Uh, those of you who want to leave, you can leave. Anyone else has any more questions? No questions? Okay. Uh, thank you for joining class. Have a blessed uh, weekend and a refreshing weekend. And see you all next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Say. Thank you.